Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, all of you to this uh, alumni association Fujita Health Alumni Association webinar. Uh, as you know, we are uh, uh, giving these webinars uh, since uh, December 2020, uh, every month. Uh, and we had uh, many uh, interesting talks and great speakers. And today we have two uh, great uh, uh, colleagues who will talk about uh, interesting topics. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Professor Ishu Bishnoi. Uh, who is uh, a moderator with me today, uh, and also uh, Dr. Uh, Bonsang Liu, who is uh, part of the organizing committee and a precious person to uh, have everything perfectly arranged during these webinars. So thank you to both of you. Uh, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, Dr. Federico Salle. Uh, Dr. Federico Salle uh, is a, a neurosurgeon. Uh, he is, uh, despite he is very young, he is uh, president of the Uruguayan Society of Neurosurgery. And he is assistant professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Hospital de Clinicas uh, uh, in uh, Montevideo, Uruguay. And he uh, did uh, um, fellowship uh, in Europe, in France, actually. Uh, he published many papers about uh, uh, many different topics uh, in the field of neurosurgery. Uh, but I, um, I think uh, uh, he, one of the main interests of uh, Professor Salle is uh, functional neurosurgery. Uh, as uh, uh, you, you made uh, this fellowship uh, in, in France about functional, right? And also uh, another interest uh, is uh, uh, awake surgery and uh, uh, connectomics uh, and low-grade and gliomas in general, and which is actually the topic uh, he's going to talk about today. Uh, the title of, uh, of his talk is Awake Surgery for Low-Grade Gliomas in the Right Hemisphere, which is a, a very uh, interesting topic, and uh, we can have a nice uh, discussion at the end of this talk, because, uh, uh, you know, we all agree nowadays that in the left hemisphere, awake surgery is very precious for language function, but uh, there are many other functions uh, besides language that we can actually control and monitor during awake surgery, even in the right hemisphere. Uh, so I think we are all very, very curious to uh, hear uh, your experience, uh, Professor Salle, uh, about uh, awake surgery uh, for uh, right hemisphere. So uh, I kindly ask uh, Professor Federico Salle to share his screen and uh, start his talk. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you very much, uh, Professor Felletti, for your precise presentation and introduction. Actually, I did have a chance to uh, do an observership with Professor Dufault in Montpellier in France, and that really changed my way of looking at this kind of uh, tumors and, and surgery and my way of um, thinking about the brain in general. So I wanted to share some, some of these thoughts with you. Um, I wanted to divide this talk in four main topics. First of all, I think it is important to highlight some concepts about general uh, management of low-grade low gliomas. Then, we're going to talk a little bit about brain functioning and white matter tracts. After that, I want to show you how we perform awake craniotomy here. As you know, there are many different ways and techniques. And at the end, we're going to concentrate in, in the right hemisphere. We're going to discuss if there is really a dominant hemisphere, what does that mean? So regarding low-grade gliomas, I think there's been a very important shift in traditional paradigm. Not very long ago, when I started my residency, 
training, that's 12 years ago, I was told that uh, this classic conception that low-grade low gliomas are benign tumors that can stay stable in time, that means without growing or showing malignant transformation for several years, and that the patients were asymptomatic, leading a normal life. These gliomas typically involve eloquent areas and surgery has a high functional risk. So the most reasonable thing to do was to just watch and wait, or at the most do a biopsy and then wait for malignant transformation and for neurological deficit to appear. And then you would, would, wouldn't have much to lose and you could operate. And I will show you why this is totally wrong. Low grade gliomas systematically grow. A spontaneous and continuous radiological growth can be demonstrated. And this paper from Dufault's group showed that they measured the volume and the velocity of diametric expansion along uh, several years. So this is a very interesting paper regarding natural history of low-grade gliomas. And in average, these tumors grow four millimeters a year. But there, there were more than 100 patients followed. And in no case, the, the, the tumor remained stable. It always grows. Of course, the, the, the rate of growth can be different. Some tumors grow two or three millimeters a year. Another ones grow 11 millimeters a year. And that velocity is a very prognostic factor, very important prognostic factor, of course. And um, it depends on intrinsic factors of the tumor, like the genetic status, and it can be modified by extrinsic, extrinsic factors like pregnancy. As you see here, it's not very difficult to measure the volume of, your, of the tumor. And we advise you to do this because if you just look at the MRI in a qualitative way, and you might think that the tumor is stable that, or it is the same, but if you actually measure the volume, you just need the, the DICOM images and the very basic software. You calculate the volume and then the, the cubic root of the double of the volume is your mean tumor diameter. You can actually get a, a graph of the evolution and then with a linear regression, you will find the velocity of expansion. And this is not only useful to, to follow your patients, also to, to assess the efficacy of treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. It will show you with, in an objective way if the tumor is growing or not. So as I, as I just said, you can see there the Kaplan-Meier curves and the cut point was eight millimeters. The tumors that grow more than eight millimeters a year will have a very bad prognosis. You can see that curve, it resembles almost a glioblastoma curve. So the rate of, of growth is, is a very important prognostic factor. And we actually recommend to to perform a second MRI after diagnosis, three to six months after, to determine this, this um, rate of growth, okay? In the, in the meantime, you will prepare the patient for, for surgery. So should we tell the patient that he has a benign tumor? Well, there are two randomized control trials um, that were carried out by the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer that recruited more than 600 patients. And the best prognosis group had a 7.7 year overall survival. So how can that be benign? Actually, low grade gliomas are not a mass, not a tumoral mass. It's a chronic infiltrative disease that progressively invades the brain subcortical connectivity migrating through white matter tracts. And malignant transformation is unavoidable, around 50%, as you know, in, 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 the, phase, in the first five years. So I think we should say this is a pre-malignant disease, never benign. And these patients, do they really have a normal life? Well, 
usually you will see it in young patients. The tumor is revealed by seizures and they have slight or no deficit at all in your clinical examination can be normal. That is because these are slowly growing lesions that allow for brain plasticity and functional reorganization of the brain. But the truth is that if you do formal neuropsychological testing, almost half of these patients do have cognitive deficit at, at the moment of diagnosis, altered verbal fluency, problems in, the, uh, in their episodic memory, attention, executive functions, psychomotor speed, and personality. So another advice is to always do a neuropsychological assessment before and after surgery, because neurocognitive deficit and epilepsy can severely affect the quality of life of these patients. And this is a very interesting paper that compared um, lymphoma and um, leukemia patients with low-grade glioma patients and healthy volunteers, of course, and their quality of life was as affected as cancer patients, hematologic cancer patients. So uh, there's no doubt that uh, these tumor affects the quality of life of these patients. Okay, so not benign, not never stable, and it and it does affect quality of life. So is it, can we change this? Can we change the natural, natural history of, the, of these tumors with uh, surgery? Well, here is, I think, the largest series published so far with more than 1,000 cases of grade two gliomas. And in this paper, they show that if you, if you remove 100% of the tumor, in, in your first surgery, the patients can live, as you see there in the blue curve, 90% of the patients can be alive 14 to 15 years after that. However, if your um, resection is 50% only, then only 30 to 40% of the patients will survive so long. And what about supratotal resection? Is it worth it? Does it change something? And you can see there on your right, another paper that gathered a, a very large number of supratotal resections. And all these patients were followed for um, eight to 16 years. And there's, there hasn't been any malignant transformation, no malignant transformation at all. All of them are alive, but not only alive, they lead a normal life with a Karnofsky performance scale more than 80, okay? So it's, it's really worth it. And the extent of resection is the, one of the most important prognostic factors. So why not to operate? Well, we are in eloquent areas and there's a high risk, but we have a solution for that. And that's brain mapping, okay, and awake surgery. And on what is elo an eloquent area anyway? Well, back in the 1800s, Franz Gall um, described what he called phrenology. And they thought that certain features of our personality were represented in different parts of the brain. And that could be reflected by the shape of the skull, something like a pseudoscientific conception that then Paul Broca, of course, changed to a more scientific way of, of view of looking at this. And this is what we know, what we learned in medical school, fixed primary um, areas, motor area, the speech area, the sensory area, visual cortex. And we were taught that we all have our speech area in the inferior frontal gyrus, that the precentral gyrus is the motor area, and this is the same for everybody. Well, we will see that that's not really the way it is, and we now think more of the connectome and the white matter to understand um, brain functioning and to guide surgery. So here's another shift in paradigms. We are changing, abandoning the Broca's localizationism to think more in a holotopic way. 
Um, and I will tell you in a minute what hodotopy means, but now neurosurgery is centered in preserving subcortical connectivity and not the cortical areas. I mean, cortical areas are of course very important, but they have plasticity. The patient can recuperate uh, if, you, if you preserve white matter tracts because white matter does not have plasticity. If you cut uh, an important white matter bundle, the patient will not recuperate because um, that's the way it is. And in the cortex, if you damage one of these areas, the patient can recuperate thanks to plasticity. And as we know now, the location of functional areas is variable between the individuals and even more in the presence of a slow growing tumor. So an individualized cartography is absolutely necessary. All, another thing that is changing is that we don't have to think of a tumor, a mass with anatomic limits that we need to remove. We think in a, neuro, in a functional neuro-oncology uh, that is centered in the functions of the brain surrounding the tumor. We think of the brain, not of the tumor. You, you just have to think that you're going to resect, remove a part of the brain infiltrated by, to, by a tumor, and you will go and as far as you, as you reach functional boundaries, no more anatomic bundles, no soul C and gyri, you will go until you find function. And this is something that we were told, of course, that language is Broca and Wernicke's area um, connected by the arcuate uh, fasciculus. And we're going to demonstrate that this is not true and this is what I said, um, we're going to try to think uh, of, of this hodotopic way of looking at the brain. And as you see, their language is a lot more than that. Okay, and there's a lot of nonverbal things in language that, that is in the right hemisphere. And I will talk about that in, the, in a minute. But basically, we will Keep in mind a ventral semantic way for language and the dorsal phonologic way. Okay, here I wanted to, to say that hodotopy is, is, is the mixture of two words, topography and hodology. Topography is the study of functional epicenters in the cortex and hodology is the study of the connectivity between these epicenters, between these hubs in the cortex. So the actual conception, the, the, the conception in the present is that the CNS is organized in complex neural multimodal networks integrated in a parallel fashion. And the brain is no longer a static structure with rigid divisions. It is, that it is a dynamic organ with great inter-individual variability. And here is a paper that I recommend you to read how to bring this to the OR, to, to practice, to reality. And one thing that I think is, is um, very real and easy to, to bring to your clinical practice is that symptoms, for instance, clinical presentation is no longer exclusively attributable to the specific location of the tumor. You have to think of disconnection syndromes, okay? Um, you might have a parietal lesion in, in your left hemisphere and the patient can have dysarthria and it's not in the frontal lobe. And why? Well, because the, the lesion can invade the white matter tracts that subserve the articulatory motor program. And that's the superior longitudinal fasciculus as we will see. Okay, so we have to stop thinking about localizationism in primary areas. That's not the way it works. We have to think of the connectome and the, and the networks that might be involved. As you see here, there's a, a tumor in the pars triangularis of the, of the left inf uh, front, inferior frontal gyrus 
you would you could say this is Broca's area. The patient will be aphasic if I remove that tumor. But as you see in the in the brain map with direct electrical stimulation, all of all of the areas of the speech have moved around this part. And this reorganization of the cortex is the plasticity that is um, provoked by this um, slowly growing tumor, and it can it could be removed totally, and the patient is still um, talking in a normal way. So we're trying to go towards a positive oncofunctional balance. That means to maximize the extent of resection, which is uh, an important prognostic factor, as I just showed you, minimizing the risk of a post-operative deficit. And we also want to achieve an adequate post-operative cognitive function very far beyond language and motor function. We cannot mm, content ourselves. We cannot be happy as neurosurgeons if our, our patient can just do this, okay, and say words. We are a lot more than that. So there are, the patient has to be able to go back to work to maintain a conversation, to, to use his working memory, to can he can he should be able to have empathy and recognize emotions in others to, to, to function in society. So all of this is only possible with awake brain mapping. Okay, so just to remember, the main white matter tracts can be divided or classified in projection fibers, commissural fibers, and association fibers. Um, as you see there on the right part, the, in this coronal um, view, the commissural fi fibers are of course in the midline, and these association, intrahemispheric association fibers are located at the level of the pupillary line. Okay, and in between, you will find the projection fibers. That's the corticospinal tract, as you see here, right here. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but here in, in red is the corticospinal tract. In blue, the thalamocortical uh, sensitive radiations. In green, the optic radiations. And here in, in yellow or orange, is the subcolossal fasciculus or frontostriatal fasciculus that is important in the ex executive con control of language. So these are the projection fibers. And these are the main association fibers that we will see in the ventral part. And let me go back just for a second. There, are, there is a, a ventral group at the level of the roof or the, of the orbit, and then a more dorsal um, group of bundles of fascicles. Okay, here in violet, you can see the inferior longitudinal fasciculus that is continued by the uncinate fasciculus to the frontal lobe. These two fascicles form the, the indirect ventral semantic pathway of, of language. And then there's in yellow, the, in, the inferior frontooccipital fasciculus or IFOF, that is a direct way to connect the occipital lobe with the orbitofrontal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Here also in, in violet is the uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus, the, the horizontal part, in green, the vertical part of this fasciculus, and in orange, the arcuate fasciculus. That is the um, dorsal pathway, phonological pathway of, of language, and we will also see its um, functions on the right side. Here are some dissections where you can see the arcuate fasciculus and the superior longitudinal fasciculus sur surrounding the, the insula. And here you can see the, the IFOF on the ventral part. As you see here, the IFOF connects the occipital lobe with the frontal lobe, and it goes through the external capsule. And you will find it underneath the insular cortex, right here, in the more ventral part. 
Okay, this is a dissection that I did myself, and it, I recommend that if you have the opportunity to, to, to use um, a frozen brain and do Klinger's technique to find the fibers yourself, this, it really helps to, to, to gain orientation during, during surgery. So the IFOF, as I said, is the ventral semantic stream for language but it also subserves non-verbal semantic association tasks and the, in the right side and facial emotion recognition. And I will show you how we can test that in, in the OR. Here is the superior longitudinal fasciculus. It has two layers, a more superficial layer with an anterior horizontal segment connecting the parietal lobe with the frontal lobe. That part in the left hemisphere um, is in charge of the articulatory pro, um, program. If you stimulate there, the patient will have dysarthria. Then there's a posterior part here in yellow, which is vertical, and it connects the temporal lobe with the parietal lobe. And this part is very important for syntactic processing. And then there's some, a deeper layer that goes directly from the temporal lobe, the posterior part, to the frontal lobe. And that's the arcuate fasciculus, which um, is in charge of phonological codification. And if you stimulate there, the patient will have phonological paraphasias. Okay. Here is another coronal view of the of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, you just need to remember that it goes in the periventricular white matter. And uh, this, uh, the frontal parietal connections are very important for working memory in the right side and spatial cognition also. So as you see, there are many functions on, in the right side and of course in the left side what, that we need to keep in mind. Here you can see again the, the, the tracts that I just uh, talked about in green, the IFOF in um, violet here, the oncinet fasciculus, here the optic radiations in orange, and here in, in sky blue, the SLF, superior longitudinal fasciculus, and in here the cortical spinal tract. Well, just to, to finish with uh, the tracts, remember the sagittal stratum in the white matter lateral to the atrium of the ventricle. That's a very important um, region because many bundles, as you see here, are uh, packed there. And if you're going to work near the, the atrium in the um, parietal temporal occipital junction, mainly in, in the left side, you need to remember that you will find the IFOF, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and the optic radiations in that part. So if the ventricle opens and you're coming from lateral to medial, you might have cut these fibers. So it's always recommended to, to approach the atrium from um, uh, the superior parietal lobe, the intraparietal sulcus, and not in, in this way um, perpendicular because you, you might put these fibers at risk. Well, so to, to take home a uh, message, um, always do early surgery for low grade gliomas at diagnosis and before any deficit, no biopsy. Surgery according to functional boundaries and not oncological anatomic boundaries that do not exist because this is not a mass, it is an infiltrative disease. Okay, and study the individual functional anatomy. You, you can never say, Well, this tumor is located in this primary area, so I will provoke um, deficit. No, you have to study the individual function. And our aim should always be to optimize both survival and quality of life. And the only way to do that is to preserve uh, cognition, is preserving cognition. So now I will show you a little bit how we do the, the, the surgical technique of, of awake craniotomy. 
And um, to begin with, there is um, different, different, there are different ways of brain mapping, a preoperative stage and an intraoperative uh, mapping. Uh, the, in the preoperative, you can do functional MRI and DTI, tractography, and try to uh, see if you have uh, functional areas um, near your tumor or where exactly are the white matter tracts. But the, the, the reality is that nothing will substitute your direct electrical stimulation during surgery. This is the most exact and precise way of finding function and your tracts because DTI will show you tracts and we will speak in a minute about that, it, but it just shows you anatomy, not function. You don't know if that bundle that the computer is reconstructing for you um, works or if it does something. You don't see function. And uh, as you see here, functional MRI for language can be specific, but its sensitivity is pretty low. And we, and this is the, the, the same impression that I get. I, I systematically do fMRI to, to, our, to my patients. And then I try to see the correlation with my um, surgery. And most of the times there are important differences. DTI, as I said, well, it can, could have 82% reliability for language, but just look at this paper um, published by 20 research groups in DDI. Their, their conclusion is that tractograms contain many more invalid land valid bundles. So, and we, we need to remember that this is a statistical um, calculation done by a computer and it, many times it, it is wrong. The most important thing is that you, the, the neurosurgeon has to know the anatomy. You, you need to know where the tracks, the white matter tracks are, and then just go and find them with your electrical stimulation. So preoperative uh, mapping, I think it's not, um, not necessary at, at all. It, could help, but it's not uh, uh, something that you must have, not at all. I will show you this case. This is a patient that I operated a couple years ago, and she, she had this insular left low grade glioma, as you see here. And I was thinking of doing a transopercular approach to the insula is the, the approach that I prefer. I prefer to avoid um, the vessels in the sylvian fissure. And the fMRI showed me that there was language here in the frontal operculum. So if what I wanted to do needed to be changed and maybe a temporal approach could be better through the temporal operculum. And this is, that this is what exactly what we found in the surgery. Here, there was language here and we had to do the approach through the temporal lobe. So in this case, the fMRI was useful, but anyway, I would have found this in, in surgery. So I think in the end, it didn't really change anything. What we always do is to, to use ultrasound to begin surgery. Once we open the dura, we do the ultrasound and really low-grade low gliomas are very hyper-echogenic. So here you can see the normal brain and here you can see the tumor. It's really easy to identify its limits with, um, with ultrasound. And this is cheaper and, uh, and the access to this is very easier compared to intraoperative MRI or neuronavigation. You, you don't really need all that. Ultrasound is, is very good and I, and I recommend it. Well, this is another case where the fMRI showed us the relationship between the tumor and the primary motor area. This patient wouldn't tolerate awake surgery. So in that case, it was useful. And we found exactly what the fMRI uh, showed. And we used um, direct electrical stimulation under, under general anesthesia. 
Well, um, we use the technique that's called asleep, awake, asleep. Uh, at first, the patient is under general anesthesia, totally intravenous anesthesia. You will need TCI targeted controlled infusion pumps and the uh, drugs used are propofol, remifentanil, and sometimes dexmedetomidine. By spectral index monitoring, the depth of your anesthesia is um, important, and we use laryngeal mask <clears throat> for the airway. Also, nerve blocks, the supraorbital, posterior auricular, auriculotemporal, and occipital nerves must be uh, blocked completely, so the scalp will be um, completely, completely anesthetized. Infiltration of the, uh, the place where the pins of your Mayfield um, headrest is, is also necessary and the incision site, of course. The position, we always use a lateral position. Doesn't matter where the tumor is located, the patient always goes lateral because we, we have tried different positions and Dufault always says that this. Lateral is very good for, because the airway, the airway is, um, is it's easier to handle the, the airway for the anesthesiologist. If you rotate the, the neck, then it, it can be difficult to, for uh, intubation or to handle the airway. Also the anatomic orientation for the surgeon, if you are, um, if the head is parallel to the floor, sometimes it, it's better and the patient is a lot more comfortable. If you, if you, put something on the shoulder and then the patient starts complaining that he's not comfortable and that can really ruin your, your surgery. So we really recommend this position. So well, you do your surgical approach, craniotomy, always remember to infiltrate with local anesthesia, the temporalis muscle, the dura mater, and then you awaken the patient. You do, once he is awake, you do the dural opening, cortical map and ultrasound, then resection with subcortical mapping, of course, and at the end, general anesthesia with intubation and closure. That part can be changed. The patient could uh, stay awake, just doing nothing if he is comfortable while, while you close. So asleep, awake, awake is another technique that we are doing sometimes um, right now. Here, as you see, are the nerve blocks, occipital, sorry, the occipital nerve, the incision, and the position. And here we mark with letters A, B, C, D, the limits of the tumor with ultrasound. Well, what are the tests recommended for, 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 uh, for the surgery, of course, you cannot do uh, a, a neurological examination that takes two hours. No, you need to choose individualized tests that are sensitive, relevant, and not too long. So this is what is recommended. Uh, the intraoperative standard assessment involves counting tasks for language and naming tasks. And then depending on the location of the tumor, you can add semantic association tasks, reading repetition and the double task. I will show you this. Of course, visual spatial cognition, visual fields, social cognition is something that you can also test in the operating room. Here is what we always do, left or right hemisphere, the patient is awake, moving his hand and naming objects at the same time. So just the fact that he's doing two things at the same time, it, it, that is the double task that um, tests working memory. You need to have your working memory intact to do um, two things at the same time. So here you can test speech naming objects. You can test, um, of course, the phonological part of speech and the semantic part. If the patient has per, um, phonological paraphasia, semantic paraphasia, you can test um, motor function. You can test executive function and uh, working memory, the double task, okay? And this is uh, another test that is called pyramids and palm tree tests. 
with three objects and the patient has to associate which of the two in the bottom goes or corresponds with the one on top. Of course, here the eye corresponds to the eyeglasses. And this non-verbal association semantic task is very important for the right hemisphere in, because um, this is a way to test the, the IFOF, okay? Also, in the right hemisphere, the superior longitudinal fasciculus is very important for the, the spatial cognition, visual spatial tasks. And it's very easy to do the bisection test. You just draw a line and the patient has to divide this line in the middle. And if you stimulate this fasciculus, you will see that the, 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 the drawing of the patient will deviate to one side or the other. Okay, so this is a way to, to explore um, spatial cognition in the OR. Then recently we started exploring um, social cognition. And as you know, the IFOF is very important for um, recognition of emotions in the, in the right side. And we do this, this, it is called reading the mind in the eyes test. And the patient has to choose one of the two options. And if you stimulate the eye of, or sometimes the prefrontal cortex in the right side, you will see very interesting um, alterations of this function. So this is the way you do it. This is another case. I'm going to speed up a little bit. So that's basically how we, how we work with a computer. Post-operative MRI. And another video of one of our surgeries. The phonoaudiologist tests um, language or the other functions that we just talked about. Okay, and this is the last slide. Just remember that now it seems like the new tradition for neurosurgeons is that for left tumors, awake surgery and language mapping, and for right tumors, general anesthesia. That's a very simplistic way of uh, viewing the things. What happens with all the other functions we have been talking about, what happens with movement, spatial cognition, social cognition, nonverbal semantics. Remember that 80% of our communication is nonverbal, recognizing emotions, recognizing, doing association tasks. What happens with working memory, executive function, personality, conscious information processing. There's a lot of functions in the right hemisphere that need to be taken into account and that we cannot continue to neglect. And finally, I recommend that if you're interested in this subject, read this paper. It summarizes all of the functions in the right hemisphere. You can find a medial system, a dorsal system with a superior longitudinal fasciculus, very important for spatial attention, and a ventral system with the IFOF that is represented there in violet, very important for emotion, recognition, affective, mentalizing, and nonverbal semantics. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, it took a little bit longer than expected. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Federico Salle, for this uh, very insightful lecture. Uh, it's an intriguing topic. Uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, modern topic nowadays because many neurosurgeons are discussing about uh, the need we have to, of course, not only preserve basic functions, like you said, language and movement, but also higher functions, uh, higher cognitive functions. Uh, I personally have many questions, but I, uh, I'm sure also the audience uh, has. Uh, I see Professor Yoko Kato who joined us and I want to welcome her. Uh, she is our mentor and major sponsor for this kind of uh, webinars and not only for webinars. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Professor Yoko Kato to uh, say something. Hi, everyone. 
thank you very much for uh, organizing such a wonderful webinar. So we are very proud of the satellite to uh, join our, the webinar, especially the special lecture. And uh, thank you so much for your uh, kind uh, uh, recommendation of the, the women in neurosurgery from uh, Uruguay. And uh, maybe uh, I will ask you the, the later some questions. Of course, okay. my pleasure. Okay, so um, I know there is also uh, Professor Abida Shah uh, connected. She is uh, uh, very well known about uh, uh, this kind of uh, surgery and connectomics. And I, I would like to ask her a uh, comment uh, about uh, this topic and this lecture, if possible. Hi, hi, Alberto. Hi, Abida. Hi, welcome. Hi, Professor Carto, thank you for sending me this interesting webinar. It was a great talk, Dr. Saleh. It was a very beautiful anatomical demonstration. I'm not sure, but even I'm interested, if you know, but I'm quite interested in white fiber anatomy. And... Uh, I do a lot of this kind of work and glioma resections based on the anatomy of the fiber tracts. And uh, recently I have proposed a kind of classification based on how gliomas spread along the fiber tracts. It will be published soon. Maybe then you can give your opinion on it. Secondly, the sonography. I completely agree with you that low-grade gliomas, I'm not sure how many people do this, but low-grade gliomas are completely hyperechoic on sonography and they give you a beautiful boundary and plane to resect it. And after your surgery, you can check. And if it's exactly. gone, you're very happy that the tumor is there. Third thing is we perform a kind of an N mass resection for, you know, you know what I say is, I don't know, uh, gliomas divided into localized and diffused. If they are localized, they are arising from short arcuate fibers of a corresponding gyrus. So when that is the situation, you can go around completely and do an N mass resection of a low-grade glioma. Not for those that arise from the long association fibers, those are of course diffuse and you go uh, piecemeal. But for the localized ones, you can do a beautiful N mass resection and you can confirm with your pre-op and post-op sonography. So I agree with you that uh, for doing glioma surgery, you have to first do cadaveric white fiber dissection. You have to correlate it with the MRI and the tractography, and then you're set to go. And of course, awake monitoring and ALA and all those will come later on in the line. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Abida. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Yes, uh, there is one question from Dr. Sneha Chitra. Uh, she has typed, I will read it to you, Professor. Uh, she's asking, how often have you encountered seizures on table and do you follow any specific protocols for preventing or treating per-operative seizures? Yes, that's a very interesting question. Intraoperative seizures can, can occur, of course. The, the percentage of this complication is about 5% in our experience, but I think that you have to keep your stimulation amplitude, the intensity of the stimulation should stay in, in 2.5 or 3 milliamps. If you go higher than that, then you, you can provoke seizures. If you don't find the, the, the areas that you're looking for with 3 milliamps, then it is probably not there. Uh, so it's not... Uh, it's not necessary to, to keep um, going up in amplitude. Then for white matter, if for subcortical stimulation, sometimes I do use like five milliamperes, but in the cortex, I think you should stay a little bit lower. And if a seizure occurs, what we do is we, we, we use cold uh, saline solution. You need to have a cold saline um, always near you and that is like magical if you if you do that the seizure will will stop in in a couple seconds thank you thank you professor uh, i have one question uh, it was very nice talk dr Federico sali and um, like uh, on right side uh, the, the, there was concept of sleep awake and then asleep uh, cranio at me so like 
do you uh, mostly do this uh, type of uh, procedure or you do sleep awake and awake procedure because if patient is tolerating tumor resection and for closer we are inducing him uh, that i was a uh, little bit uh, not sure about that yeah well the the truth is that in this last times we we use awake i'm um, sorry asleep awake awake because the patients are so comfortable that you can start closing and you just tell the patient to rest close his eyes and if you, and that and that's okay most of the times otherwise if the patient is too tired too uncomfortable and you cannot continue well then sometimes it is necessary to induce general anesthesia again but the truth is that it's not easy for the anesthesiologist to intubate the patient in in that position with the headrest all of the the, dra the draping and everything so if you can just do a little bit of sedation and let the patient rest um, while you close, it's a very good option and we are starting to do that. Sedation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I also have uh, some questions, as I said uh, before. Um, I really enjoyed your, your talk. I uh, also like to use uh, ultrasounds during tumor resection. Uh, I agree with you and uh, with Abida, uh, it's a very, very useful uh, tool. And I have some experience in awake surgery, but mainly for uh, the left hemisphere. So um, I know that uh, to set up, uh, you know, uh, this kind of, uh, of surgery, uh, you, you need to uh, gather many experiences. So it's, uh, neurosurgeon is not enough alone. Uh, you need a good neuropsychology team, you need uh, uh, dedicated anesthesiologists, uh, and especially for the right hemisphere, uh, I guess uh, you need some dedicated protocols. So my question is, uh, do you have your own protocols to monitor uh, the right uh, hemisphere functions? Um, how long does it take to, uh, you know, get the whole team prepared? I guess it's a major um, uh, problem of the neuropsychological team, uh, so which is the correct uh, training to perform um, an effective uh, awake surgery in the right hemisphere. And uh, how long does it take to uh, get familiar with ultrasounds in your opinion because ultra, also ultrasounds it's a, an operative dependent uh, method so uh, i think these are very important information for uh, young neurosurgeons to know yes thank you for your question of course it, it's not easy it takes several years to develop a, a team that can work confidently in this kind of surgeries as you said, the anesthesiologist is key, is a key. You need to find someone who is trained in this type of anesthesia. Otherwise, it can be a complete disaster. The brain can, can be very swollen and you can have seizures. It, it, it's, it can be a disaster. Also, uh, as you said, the neuropsychologist needs to, to learn to be in an operating room. That's, that's very different for them. They are used to, to an office work and uh, you need to, to learn to communicate the surgeon with the neuropsychologist and, and well talk to each other. And it's very important to keep the same team always together. And as far as, as I go, well, it took me about I, I must say two to four years to, to gather experience to do this in a, in a confident way. And we have a very strong cooperation with France. And I went several times to, to Montpellier. Professor Dufault came to Uruguay several times. He trained, um, in, or some of our anesthesiologists went there to get training. And, and of course, it's, it's, it's not easy. But if you have people interested in this and you have the opportunity to 
to travel or to participate in this kind of educational activities. I think it's something that if I can do it, if we could do it here, anyone can do it. And it's not only me saying this. Dufour said this to me the first time. You, you don't need to be a genius to do this. You just have to, to want to do it and get training and the learning curve will take, of course, a couple, two, three, four years, but eventually you will be able to do it. <clears throat> and uh, well, I think I, I answered your question. Yeah. And oh, about the protocols. Yeah. The protocols for the right side. Well, we have a basic protocol. We, we always do the, the double task. So naming and, and uh, movement to examine it working memory and the association, nonverbal association tasks, and also, well, uh, spatial cognition if the, the tumor is more parietal and the facial recognition. Uh, the, the emotions of facing faces also. So we, we basically adapt or individualize the tests to the, the patient, his, also his social, cultural, educative level, what he does for a living, everything is important. It's not the same to operate, of course, a musician or, or an engineer or uh, I mean, someone that works in, in, in the countryside. So you need to adapt your tests to, to the patient. But basically we do that in, in the right side. Yeah, I was asking because when I visited uh, Dufault in Montpellier uh, several years ago, he, I remember he was actually working on the protocol to monitor these higher yes, he cognitive functions. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a very interesting topic. So I think uh, we should move on. Question. We have another question. I have, oh, I yes. have a question, if it's, that's Dr. okay. Dr. Mirna Sobana, who is uh, our yes. next speaker, has a question. Uh, Professor Sale, I, I, I would, uh, I'm curious about the procedure for the children. Well, how, how old the youngest, uh, the youngest you do for this uh, procedure and what's the, uh, pitfalls or the talents to do that in the patient in the younger children in the younger age well that, that's a very interesting question <laughs> yeah, the, the youngest patient that i operated on had 15 years old okay she, she was very young but we always have a psychologist in our team that has an interview with the patient and um, if the patient can understand what is going to happen and if he is willing to participate, because this is a team, I mean, it's very different. You, you, you no longer have the patient that is there under general anesthesia and everything depends on you. Here, the patient is a part of your team. So um, he needs to, to be convinced that that he is going to cooperate and understand what's going to happen. And we also, um, carried out a study with all of our patients to investigate whether um, they felt anxiety, fear, and how they felt during awake surgery. And um, all of our patients said that they were confident, they were, um, they were not anxious during surgery, and that they had a tolerable, completely to well-tolerated experience. So, uh, to answer your question, I don't have a specific age limit, but I think from 15, 16 years old and older, you can do this. Yes, because, uh, you know, the children is a pretty different psych psychologically to take this yes. procedure. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think children could, could um, undergo this. Surgery. Yeah, it's a more difficult population to treat, actually, for these reasons. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, we should move to uh, the next uh, uh, speaker uh, because uh, time is uh, running very fast. Uh, so I ask, uh, kindly ask uh, my co moderator, uh, Professor Ishubishnoi, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, dear. 
uh, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Mirna uh, Sobana. She is from Indonesia and uh, a woman new neurosurgeon. And she has did her neurosurgery from Pajajaran University uh, from Indonesia. And currently she is head of pediatric neurosurgery at uh, Hassan Sadikin General Hospital. And uh, she is a reviewer of uh, child nervous system. And she has published more than 10 uh, public papers. And uh, she has a keen interest in uh, pediatric neurosurgery. And her papers are mainly about uh, pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, she has been speaker in more than 20 uh, international national conferences and webinars. And today she is going to speak about seizures in hydrocephalus patients. So I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Midna Soban. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, moderator, Dr. Bisnoy. Today I will talk about the seizure in hydrocephalus. Uh, I was uh, in, uh, uh, in working on uh, about the seizure in hydrocephalus. Before I go further, I want to introduce you my uh, hometown. This is Bandung. Professor Kato might be uh, visit us. Uh, in some uh, years ago, in a years ago, but in early 2000, maybe with Professor Kano, uh, you visit our center. This is Hassan Sadikin Hospital. Uh, and then this is our uh, university is across the street from our hospital. Uh, why we have to learn about hydrocephalus. There, uh, we all might be thinking that hydrocephalus is just like that. that we can as already finished the chapter of the hydrocephalus. Is that really is we has finished the chapter of hydrocephalus. It, it's a really simple thing, probably. Uh, my friend, uh, my friend and uh, a neurosurgeon in US, he was a graduate from Fujita sometime. Uh, he teasing me if he asking me, what, what are you going to do today? I will put on Pipisan. And he said, what? It's not a neurosurgeon job, it's a nurse job. I said, well, is that really, is that a hydrocephalus is not an important thing, why? Uh, in global burden of disease in neurosurgery, hydrocephalus seems to be uh, in the higher uh, incidence uh, you can see here, uh, the first one is traumatic brain injury, and then hydrocephalus is uh, in the second place. It's 40, 42,000 cases annually, uh, and then we have still a lot to do. And uh, in the worldwide uh, region, uh, we see that uh, here also, Hydrocephalus in Southeast Asia still, um, in my country, in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, hydrocephalus seems to be still in a large number. It's 53,000 annually. Uh, the highest rank is Africa, but in Latin America is also high. And the third is our, uh, our region. Uh, we all, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't think I need to talk about uh, the pathophysiology, the uh, classification or uh, definition. Maybe uh, you all has already learned about it in, in, uh, in the first uh, years of your neurosurgery residency. Here also my resident uh, are watching me right now talking. Uh, maybe uh, they also had already knew about uh, the Hydrocephalus. I will jump to the treatment. Also, it would be uh, very short talking about this. Uh, the natural history untreated congenital hydrocephalus is progressive cognitive decline and early death, usually before the third decade of life. Why? Uh, three. Uh, in the early uh, 13th, uh, 20th uh, century, they do open craniotomy, they do uh, crude endoscopic methods, and in uh, 1960s, they do uh, silastic, neurosurgeon do silastic tubing, valve mechanisms, CSF diver diversion, EVD, subgaleal drainage, 
chanting vipisan, ventriculo atrial san, ventriculo pleural san, and uh, and then the elastic tubing uh, uh, change into the valving mechanism and then flow regulating valve mechanism antisiphonic and gravitation device as a, a programmable sign. Sun. Here's the uh, usual VB sun, and then this is programmable sun. And the last time, the last one is endoscopic third ventriculostomy, uh, which is uh, made a bypass from the third ventricle through the subarachnoid space. Uh, and then the last uh, Benjamin Worf and uh, uh, Professor uh, Abaya Kurkarni uh, do the ADV plus CPC procedure to uh, treat the hydrocephalosis. That all, uh, uh, for the last 15 years, uh, maybe you know, uh, it's 16 years already, uh, we do the treatment uh, for hydrocephalosis surgery, patient is clinically improved due to the correction of the intracranial pressure, the improvement of the white matter blood flow. But however, the surgery doesn't reverse the inborn brain defects. Yeah, uh, yeah this is the uh, uh, this is the 14, uh, 14 uh, years ago. They said 15 years after the introduction of the Vipishan of treatment hydrocephalus, we must acknowledge that the sun is not a cure of hydrocephalus. Yes, we still are searching what is the best treatment for be better outcomes in hydrocephalus patient. Why? Because we have to improve the hydrocephalus children quality of lives uh, because uh, the family has a uh, uh, that got the impact from the, uh, or the, if they have child with hydrocephalus and then the uh, the financial financially would be uh, 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 got a big impact for them. But see why I would like to uh, mention about Caesar in hydrocephalus. Uh, we do meta-analytic study uh, in the re, uh, it's published in child nervous system and uh, earlier uh, this year uh, from uh, from thousands of uh, literature we we get and then we uh, we do the meta-analytic study we conclude that uh, the epilepsy or seizure had 15.75 times more risk of epilepsy and seizure. Uh, and we, we, from this, uh, we think about, uh, we will continue about uh, the seizure study. Uh, at first, uh, the second of uh, our research will be, uh, is, uh, it's already done. Uh, the, about the periventricular hypodensity from CD or MRI in hydrocephalus patient, but with uh, seizure in uh, presented uh, patient with hydrocephalus. This uh, study is to explain the pathophysiology seizure uh, in the subset of patient with history of pre uh, present seizure in hydrocephalus patient. Our hypothesis suggests that the pre-existing brain injury due to the hydrocephalus itself may, might be one of the factors that uh, causes seizure in this patient. Uh, we can see here the uh, periventricular hypodensity. Uh, we call that periventricular hypodensity. We use a CT scan more than the uh, MRI in our center because uh, the MRI cost very much uh, um, and then uh, to, to get the MRI imaging uh, is not, uh, we cannot do that very fast. We have to wait uh, for five days to weeks uh, to do the MRI. So for uh, almost uh, all the case, we do the, uh, the CT scan. But uh, you see for the neonate or uh, we do the U, U ultrasonographic first, 
and then before right before the surgery if it needed we do the uh, CT scan or or if uh, the patient is lucky the MRI can do it quickly we do the MRI so uh, from this uh, CD or MRI, we can see here the uh, hypodensity in the MRI. You can see here the hyperdensity in the T2 uh, MR T2 weighted image, or from the flare, uh, we can see the hyperintensity, uh, which is uh, we thought we have hypothesized that uh, it happened, uh, the inflammation is happen happening there. Uh, the ependymal denudation and then uh, causing uh, the, which is the inflammation uh, causing the ependymal denudation or the uh, uh, the excitation and then uh, the uh, the fluid is uh, going out through the uh, ependymal junction that uh, has damage. Uh, from our uh, single, retros uh, single center retrospe uh, retrospective study in Hassan Sadikin Hospital for four years uh, since 2017 until 2020, we got uh, 30, uh, uh, 334 patients, uh, one, uh, 147 or 44 percent of patients had seizure before sun placement. Uh, we can see here uh, the significant uh, result uh, in the seizure or uh, the presence of the seizure and then um, in the uh, infectious and non-infectious patient. Uh, here in the patient, uh, the patient's char characteristic from medical record uh, identified three three factors that strongly associated with the incidence of hydrocephalus. First is the patient age. Uh, do you can see it clearly? Because uh, something blocked my uh, my screen. Do you think, do you, do you, can you see all the uh, screen? Yes, we can see. Yes, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, the first is patient age and then uh, the, sec the second is the type of the hydrocephalus. It's uh, between the communicating hydrocephalus and non-communicating hydrocephalus. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the 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 result is pretty significant, and most significant is uh, we can see it in the patient whether they are uh, got infectious or non-infectious. The non-infectious uh, hyd uh, hydrocephalus uh, shows more uh, seizure on the patient. I would like to. Uh, highlight this and then uh, this we can see the periventricular hypodensity uh, we 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 are uh, we see we we are studying not about uh, the this true one one two three four five uh, through four uh, places but we study the periventricular hypodensity in many places uh, in the um, CD or MRI, uh, we can uh, we do the uh, first the univariate study. After evaluating the medical record, we examine the result of uh, from the head CT scan to assess the presence of the periventricular hypodensity and look at their possible association with the incidence uh, of seizure. Uh, we can see here the periventricular hypodensity. Uh, shows uh, seizure in a very large number from 147. Uh, it, uh, the patient with seizure is 132. Uh, it's uh, almost, uh, it's 64.3%, it's very high. And from the patient with no uh, periventricular hypodensity, uh, the, uh, the seizure, uh, the, the patient has no seizure, is a lot of, has a lot of number, and it shows the very significant associated uh, between the periventricular hypodensity with the incidence of seizure. 
After we only analyze the presence of periventricular hypodensity, we look into the specific location where the periventricular hypodensity occurred, then analyze their association with incidence of so seizure in, independently or univariate. We found that periventricular hypodensity in every location has strongly associated uh, with incidence of seizure. We found here that the temporal horn, right temporal horn, have uh, the most uh, significant p value. Here you can see the type density of temporal horn in the multivariate analysis. Uh, we can identify the location of the periventricular hypodensity has the uh, strongest association with seizure. Uh, for conclusion, uh, the previous literature also stated that the prevalence of the seizure among hydrocephalic children ranges between 20 to 50 percent. Similar to this finding, majority of hydrocephalic children who were treated uh, in 2017 until 2020 at our center had no in uh, had non uh, non infectious etiology. It is reasonable to speculate that this is might be related to incidence of CNS infection that has been sug suggested to be a higher in the first few years of life. Despite majority of hydrocephalus cases were non infectious, the number of infectious hydrocephalus cases in present seizure uh, in the present seizure group remain significantly higher than non-infectious hydrocephalus cases in the same group is uh, 18 over 140 is 54.4 uh, percent uh, uh, and uh, the non-infectious is uh, 67 I'm sorry, the, the infectious is 67 over the 47 uh, patient. And then the presence of the periventricular hypodensity represent the direct consequence of the ventricular dilatation. Periventricular hypodensity on CT findings of hydrocephalic patient has been regarded as sign of impairment impaired in ependymal lining of ventricle as CSF barrier, transependymal CSF infiltration into cerebral white matter and decellularization in the periventricular brain area. None of these consequences have been associated, associated directly with the seizure. However, it is tempting to speculate that in any of this pathology, but a pathogenesis, inflammation occurs. Interestingly, multivariate analysis uh, identified temporal horn on the right vent lateral ventricle is as the, the location of the periventricular hypodensity that has strongest association with seizure incidence, followed by periventricular hypodensity at temporal horn of the left lateral ventricle. Is it tempting to hypothesize that the association between periventricular hypodensity at temporal horn of the lateral ventricle and seizure is due to the existence of hippocampus inferior to temporal horns. Uh, this is the, uh, the diagram or uh, uh, chart brought by uh, Professor Fezani et al. in uh, the uh, study 2016 that the initial Injury. Every initial injury of the in the in the perifer or in the CNS, uh, whether it's uh, for trauma, infection, autoimmune, or stroke, uh, uh, could could uh, could lead to inflammation in the end. Uh, whether the perifer, uh, periphery infection or auto autoimmune, they lead to uh, locus loc locusite and blood brain barrier breakthrough, and then they release the albumin and. Uh, 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 the immunoglobin G, and then uh, all of this, uh, even the glial tumor, the neurons, the GABA, uh, GABA in neurons, astrocyte, glutamate release, um, neurogenesis in the neuron or glia, uh, all leads to the increasing of the excitability 
and the increase uh, increased excitability can juice inducing the seizure or epilepsy and then lead to inflammation and the inflammation itself could cause the seizure or epilepsy or increasing the excitability this is like the uh, circle uh, the circle that never stop or the circle that we have to a uh, lot learn from that Thank you very much. That's all from me. Uh, it's uh, very nice if you had quest any question or uh, input for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mirna Sobana. It was a very nice lecture and very informative. And uh, this uh, lecture also showed new insights that uh, the periventricular hypodensity it carries so much significance. And uh, it's interesting to know uh, the hypothesis that uh, the role of uh, temporal horn uh, uh, hypodensity that is leading to pressure on hippocampus or irritation of hippocampus and ca causing more seizures, maybe this hypothesis can uh, result into new treatment options for seizure control in hydrocephalus. So I, I, I would like to ask our audience to, uh, if they have any questions, uh, they, they can directly ask or they can type question, please. Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mirna, for this uh, nice presentation and to showing us for showing us your uh, published study, uh, which is actually interesting. Um, actually, yes, I, I one of my questions was, uh, 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 how to explain the fact that uh, periventricular hypodensity, which is a problem uh, in the in the white matter, can affect uh, uh, seizures, which are supposedly uh, originating from the cortex. So you you said it's mainly, if I got it straight, it is mainly a compression uh, mechanism in your hypothesis uh, on the hippocampus. Is it correct? Thank you, Alberto. Uh, actually, uh, the seizure could be anything. In uh, in our ITRO data, it's not only uh, uh, caused by direct compression or uh, the compressor from the hydrocephalus it itself. We collect all the data, uh, whether it's uh, from brain tumor or uh, any anything, anything. We can uh, we we. We collect all the data pre-shunted hydrocephalus, uh, but they got scissor uh, before they got shunted. And uh, we think whether that uh, it's come from the cortex or it's come uh, from the uh, large enlargement of the uh, hydrocephalus, uh, there got to be uh, something that uh, intrigue, uh, trigger the inflammation. Uh, in, uh, the inflammation in the process of the seizure. Uh, maybe there's a, a change in the bio, biomolecular, uh, there's a biomolecular changes in the CSF or this in the, uh, we can see that in the CSF, of course, uh, I hope so because I still run off another study or uh, maybe it's changes in the electrolyte uh, in the excitation uh, of the intracellular uh, excitation from uh, electrolytes, it, it might be uh, related to them, uh, related to the inflammation. And then we are very curious to check out the inf inflammatory uh, biomarker from that. So uh, whether it's from came from the cortex or whether it comes from uh, the enlargement of the ventricle itself, uh, we can uh, we cannot see the different uh, right, right now, right now we saw that we we took a big a big number of sample. I, I guess uh, the sample is uh, quite big enough. 30. Yeah, yeah. And another question related to this point: uh, uh, Have you ever um, studied these patients uh, with EEG to more precisely locate the origin of this epileptic uh, activity? in order to eventually correlate uh, uh, the periventricular hypodensity presence with a specific location in the cortex? Yes, the, our, our, uh, second, uh, our second study, 
uh, is done to the patient, uh, which is before doing shine. So the condition before doing shine in our protocols, there's no, uh, there's no uh, protocols to do EEG before the shunting. Usually, the patient come in the uh, acute, uh, acute uh, condition. So we are. Uh, that's not our protocols to do the EEG first, uh, but we uh, we just do the what we have to do to treat the patient very quick. Uh, so if we want to do the EEG, it's it's gotta be after a repetition. So uh, this study will will still uh, running and then. Uh, and we have to do a lot of study after this. This is just uh, steps of uh, preliminary study before another our study. But uh, we are we are study will will concern about hydrocephalus and Caesar. It's like that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, infection that you had in your patients was it tb was um, it tuberculosis uh, yes all of uh, almost all uh, the the most common uh, infection in our country is tb uh, so it's very uh, it's very high in our country it's the second the second place after india in this uh, tuberculosis uh, re global report right now yeah uh, so in, in these patients with TB, so do you think the formation of small tuberculomas or exudates on the surface of the cortex or in the subarachnoid space or yes. in the parent is responsible for the seizure rather than the hydrocephalus? What do you think about that? Yes, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, this, uh, uh, in our study, we, we only... We only see the patient with hydrocephalus and seizure. Uh, it doesn't matter whether whether in the cortex they have tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis granuloma or something, uh, or just like I mentioned before, it doesn't matter. Uh, in the cortex had a, a tumor or a neoplasm, another neoplasm or uh, bleeding or something. We collect all the samples and then uh, all we thought, all we thought is about uh, is back to the inflammatory uh, inflammatory inflammation changes uh, inside the uh, brain on its intracellular uh, we that we will uh, that we will uh, took uh, see in the changes in the CSF uh, maybe comparing in the serum just like that we believe that all the matter is come back to the inflammation itself. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Uh, uh, Dr. Mirna, uh, did you consider that uh, shunt malfunction would be the cause of uh, seizures uh, in those shunted patients? Uh, excuse me? I'm sorry. After doing shunt and uh, despite that, uh, they are having seizures. So one, we also consider one possibility of VPS and malfunction. And sometimes oh. it, it manifests only by seizures, not by uh, headache or uh, vomiting. Uh, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken about your question, uh, the, the seizure after shun, after shunted, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, my, my study is not about the, uh, all, my, all of the study is still fresh shun, but I, or uh, I, I already read about the studies of uh, Caesar after shunt. They usually, uh, uh, there's about many, many, many study uh, say that the Caesar is uh, uh, triggered by the sun placement, uh, whether the sun placement is in the, uh, in the frontal, uh, in the frontal horn trajectory or the uh, temporal uh, occipital horn trajectory uh, the it the same it the same uh, it could uh, trigger the uh, the seizure but not in all patient but not in all patient but it could uh, for some patient it could be uh, 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 making seizure uh, after that 
but uh, 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 and then after that, if there's a sun malfunction that needed uh, to remove the sun, uh, usually from infection of the sun, we, uh, we, we, we of course remove the sun and then we treat the uh, hydrocephalus until there's a uh, bacteria free for two, uh, two or three times. And then we put on the shun again, or we revise the sun, whether there's because of the infection or uh, sun malfunction would be not because infection. All of the re uh, replacement of the shun mm -hmm. could make the uh, incidency of the seizure could be higher than before. So lesser number of the uh, sun placement and then more more sun replacement will be uh, prone to uh, higher incidence of seizure. Okay. And do you treat uh, all uh, hydrocephalus uh, cases with VP shunt? Uh, you mentioned also uh, obstructive cases, non-communicating cases. In those uh, cases, uh, what, what do you, you perform VP shunt or uh, endoscopy? We we do uh, the fibrisan. Uh, uh, we do the uh, treatment for hydrocephalus based on what the patient needed, and then uh, what uh, is the indication of the uh, the shan. Just like if we found if we found the uh, periventricular uh, enhancing enhancing in the uh, contrast uh, CT scan or MRI, we we will thought that it would be. Uh, an infectious hydrocephalus, we will not put the sun, we will put the EVD first or subgaleal uh, drainage or something. Uh, and then if the, uh, for the uh, clear uh, non-bacterial hydrocephal uh, hydrocephalus, we will put the, uh, if it uh, communicating an infection, we of course see the uh, EDV success score rate. And then uh, after that, if, uh, if the uh, EDV successful score rate for the obstruction, we do the uh, EDV for the patient, such as the obstructive of, of the uh, aqueduct or fourth ventricle uh, obstruction because of the uh, in, uh, infratentorial tumors. We might do the, uh, the EDV before the surgery, but uh, if the uh, infratentorial brain tumor is quite very big and the prepontine cistern is uh, too narrow, we will uh, not do the, uh, the EDV uh, or nor do the, the, the shan. We just take out the tumor uh, as, uh, yeah, we want, uh, we want it hundred percent. And then we will observe after the, after the surgery, whether, uh, whether the, uh, hydrocephalus still exists or not. If the hydrocephalus still exists, we will do another uh, treatment for the patient. And before doing, uh, if the intracranial pressure is high uh, during uh, during the surgery or before the surgery, we will do the uh, uh, the drainage of the uh, CSF from the then this point with the EVD, and then we remove it right away after the surgery. Like thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mirna. Um, I think we have uh, also uh, Sharon connected. Is Sharon connected with us? Is, is uh, 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 um, yeah, it's... she's on the attendee list. Can you get on the panel? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I cannot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Okay, so maybe Sharon, can you uh, can you hear us now? And maybe can you talk? Yeah, thank you so much, Alberto. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Because I got so in I, earlier, I think, so I wasn't on the panel list. No, yeah, no sorry. I, I, I didn't notice uh, among uh, uh, the yeah, it's okay, it's okay. so no, I, no. I would like a comment from you. You are a, a, a women in neurosurgery okay, member, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> you can have your uh, time to, to have a comment on these uh, nice topics today. 
Yeah, it was very, very good, uh, very interesting. Uh, Prof. Frederico, thank you very much. I think uh, awake surgery is something that is uh, actually um, sort of taking us now in most, most of the neurosurgeons are, are trying to do it, especially the ones who are interested in oncology. Um, of course, we have our experience here in Malaysia too. Um, not so much as you, but yes, we do have experience and I'm trying to encourage the younger neurosurgeons to pick it up, to make, uh, I think uh, making brain mapping very important, uh, doing it with awake surgery. I think of course, um, you, like you said, there is of course uh, fluorescence, 5 ALA and all that, but I think um, more than that, awake, awake craniotomy is uh, quite important, I think. I think we've come to realize it, especially us who have been operating for many years, have come to sort of appreciate it more. Uh, and thank you so much for connecting us with your Uruguayan win. I think Prof. Uh, Kato uh, connected me. I think I emailed you uh, once and you've given us very good uh, women to join in our committee. So thank you very much because we really want to connect with South America. So thanks That's again. That's uh, our interest too. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's good. And um, yeah, so because it's great to connect with South America. I think we in Asia, we have a lot of uh, common common kind of experiences. We are growing together in this yes. neurosurgery uh, fraternity. So, you know, yeah, that's great because we can share experience. And Mirna, there was a good presentation. I enjoyed it. I think uh, hydrocephalus is something quite common in our region, like you said. Yeah. We have a lot of cases in Malaysia. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's interesting how you've connected the um, infections and the um, hydrocephalus and seizures. I think uh, like what both you and Abi have mentioned, uh, TB is I think one of the most common things. And I think I have to agree with them. Uh, uh, be, maybe we have to think of you know whether it's you know smaller tuberculomas that are causing these seizures. Um, yeah, like you said, the non-communicating. I think most of the time they're congenital, so I don't think they really they do well basically after they're shunted and they're shunted early. But most of our patients they already come with seizures, you know, the ones with infection. So I think that itself makes it a bit difficult to treat, even if we shunt them. And what I see nowadays is all these infected cases who come in. The problem is um, once you shunt them and the shunt gets infected, then they become multi-loculated. And then you put in the ETV, I mean, you put in your endoscope, you try to break up the locules. And then it's like a, I don't know, vicious cycle, I should say. And at the end, you're treating the parents more than you're treating the child. I don't know. I don't yeah. know how you feel about this. <laughs> that's, but, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, it's very it's, complicated. I, I don't know. When, when do you say, you know, I've done the maximum and, you know, um, you know, this is where I should stop or how do you go keep on treating the child? Um, I don't know. I'm sure, Mirna, you, you have this similar experience in Indonesia. I, yeah, I, 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 last night, I, last night, I, last night, I was just uh, do one of the multiloculated hydrocephalus. It's, uh, it's really complicated. One. It, uh, we do surgery is very often. And um, sometimes, uh, uh, in the first time, all, all we have to uh, to think the goal first is uh, to uh, to heal the infection so the bacteria will, will go to zero in every uh, in every culture uh, of the bacteria and then after that we do the fen fenestration for multiloculated hydrocephalus we have to open every spaces and then after that we put on the shun uh, to, to the uh, to uh, to the peritoneum, but sometimes uh, we have a referred patient that has already put on the shun, even though the patient has already infected, but they still only remove the old shun and then they don't check about the uh, 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 the CSF culture. Uh, then they put on the shun, and after we check on the uh, CSF the bacteria zero for the three, two or three times, we put on the shun, right, to the, uh, to the peritoneal. But after that, again, the head become enlarged again. Because it's usually because of the absorption intraperitoneum is not adequate. It could be caused by uh, kistic, uh, kista, uh, pseudo kist in the, uh, uh, in the peritoneum, or uh, there's adhesive of the, uh, GIT to the uh, peritoneal wall, and then uh, it caused uh, the sun is not working very well. It's really complicated. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
I understand. <laughs> we, have, we have the same issues. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. You have this kind of issues in uh, in your center, Alberto? Because we get a lot of this. And I see, I see it more happening more often nowadays, especially like what Mina said about the pseudocysts in the abdomens. We've seen it more commonly. Uh, yeah, well, in my country, uh, I guess uh, this uh, situation is less common than in your countries, but uh, we still uh, see uh, some uh, little patients uh, and they have uh, these uh, bad situations uh, and they represent a big, huge problems for us, actually, because of course you can do something with uh, uh, endoscopy. Uh, to try to connect uh, different uh, uh, cysts uh, or compartments, uh, but not easy at all. Not yes, easy at all. Easy. It's a yes. it's a battle every time. I agree. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure. Do you think intratecal uh, uh, antibiotics uh, makes it worse by loculating the uh, infections? I'm not sure. I um, I, in my institution, we try to avoid this nowadays. Uh, in a few cases, I did with, uh, you know, uh, hydrocy hydrocephalus caused by infection and uh, intraventricular pus. I um, did aspiration of uh, pus in, uh, in the ventricles, scratching uh, with the endoscope. I use a flexible endoscope, as you know, so I can reach uh, any uh, ventricle and I scratch with the tip of the endoscope uh, the walls uh, of the ventricles and just to remove as much as you know pass as possible uh, but it's a th these are the very difficult cases yes usually we don't do intratecal uh, antibiotics uh, injection though okay so i think uh, we uh, are running out of time uh, it was a, a very nice uh, uh, time with all of you. We had uh, two great speakers, two uh, very interesting talks uh, and many questions. The discussion was very active. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is very nice. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Federico Salle, of course, uh, and Dr. Mirna Sobana for, uh, for their talks. Uh, Professor Ishu Bishnoi, my co-moderator, thank you very much. Uh, and all uh, the people who uh, joined the discussion. Uh, I would like uh, uh, Professor Yoko Kato uh, maybe to uh, give her final comments before closing the session. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for a nice presentation, uh, especially Federico. Uh, as in the future, uh, the awake surgery can be more uh, as a closer the, the daily, the neurosurgical, uh, I think, uh, the surgery in the future, because for the moment, still we have a uh, lot of pre preparation and also the, the training uh, we need. So but I think in the future, but because uh, uh, awake surgery is uh, uh, extreme, the minimally invasive, the treatment for the patient, I think. So uh, in, in that means it uh, should be easier our daily <laughs> uh, treatment. Thank you so much. So yes. I, I think that you should uh, uh, accumulate your uh, cases in the future. The, let us know uh, once again. And uh, Milna, yeah. <laughs> Milna, and thank you very much for a nice presentation. And uh, the recently uh, I heard some uh, uh, concept of the hydrocephalus itself uh, is a bit changed. So I think uh, in the future, uh, it can be addition to your research work, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kato. I'm I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. My uh, my video cannot be start again. Uh, I'm so sorry. It's uh, my it's my laptop it's, maybe. It's very beautiful uh, photo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kato. Uh, yes, uh, the hydrocephalus. We we still have to to do some research because the. Uh, our our treatment usually uh, not right now is only for decompress decompress the uh, ICP in, inside the ventricle that uh, to avoid that uh, the uh, the damage to the brain and to the white matter uh, and make the blood uh, 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 the vascularization runs very well after the decompression but. Uh, 
we will we have to think uh, uh, more uh, to the uh, to, to the first to the first time uh, if we if we can uh, we, if we can do something that uh, can uh, can be predicted and then can be can be uh, can be uh, prohibit uh, uh, treat before the seizure occur after shun uh, based on the inflammation uh, biomolecular uh, inflammatory biomolecular factor or not uh, electrolyte uh, changes if we can detect it earlier maybe we can do better treatment for the patient so that the patient uh, could not have to uh, receive any uh, complication just like seizure in the future after uh, they do vipishan or not, not anything else uh, because of we treat the patient with surgery just like that uh, kato sensei so tonight we have more than 35 participants. I think in the future, the more and more the doctors can join our alumni webinar. Thank you very much for all of you and especially the good panelists and good discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Yoko Kato. Thank you, Thank very you much. to all of you and have a nice uh, day or evening, uh, wherever you are mm -hmm. in the world, <laughs> and see you <laughs> next time. Bye.